should say um, we hadn't coordinated with uh, Dimitri, so we're actually going to be talking about a lot of the same things. Uh, our panel concerns the effects, the impact of media on early childhood. And I would say the chief difference, he sort of set the stage uh, for us. What we're going to talk about is our readings of the status of the literature as a whole. So we're not really going to be specifically speaking about our own research, but it'll be part about it. And we'll, uh, essentially, we're, we're going to be taking broad swipes at uh, different issues in the field. And we'll structure this as a series of my questions to the panelists, but I'm going to read an introduction first. <laughs> In my early research on children's TV viewing during the 1970s, I found that, according to parents, their children did not start to watch television until they were about two and a half years old. Um, I was interested in Dimitri saying four years old in 1970. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think it was about two and a half. Uh, but, uh, but we can talk about that later. This corresponded with my laboratory observations that infants and toddlers did not pay substantial visual attention to Sesame Street until they were about two and a half. So what the parents were saying fit in perfectly with our observations of children's uh, visual attention to the uh, program that at that time was pitched to the youngest age group. Rather, the TV att attracted their attention sporadically, and episodes of visual attention were relatively brief, rarely lasting more than a few seconds. This made sense because subsequent research in my lab and other people's labs indicated that under two and a half years, infants and toddlers' comprehension of television, as it then existed, was at best fragmented and partial. With age and experience, as their comprehension grew, children's attention to TV became more sustained and program preferences broadened, although adult-level comprehension was probably not attained until children were about 12 years old. And one thing I would add to uh, what Dimitri said is that a big part of children's learning how to understand television is learning how to uh, interpret cinematic montage. That is the logical re and, and other kinds of relationships between shots. So when you have something like Baby Einstein where the shots don't have logical relationships between them, that's probably about the way one-year-olds are actually understanding all of TV, uh, sort of at the level of the individual shot. But by about two and a half, children become very sensitive to cinematic montage. And if you play fast sequences of shots that don't make sense, they'll pay far less attention to the, to the same program. If you just put the shots in random order, they'll pay far less uh, attention to it than they will if you put them in the original intended meaning order. In other words, meaning clearly begins to emerge uh, for the children at around two years of age and is firmly established by about two and a half years. With the age, all right. Anyway, these observations that we had were about also consistent with industry practice. Nielsen ratings in the 1970s, for example, only applied to children two years and older. There was a lot of concern about the, there was not a lot of concern about the impact of TV on infants and toddlers because for the most part they didn't appear to watch TV. Once they can comprehend the content, however, children clearly learn from TV. While on the one hand they could learn to be aggressive and discourteous if their media diet included a lot of violent action programs, on the other hand, they could greatly improve their school readiness and positive social behavior from educational content in programs such as Sesame Street. These positive effects are traceable through high school. Prior to the 1990s, the research story was relatively simple. Content was king. 
If you gave preschool children positive and enriching content, their development was enhanced in a positive and enriched manner. Or, alternatively, garbage in, garbage out. There was little impact on infants because they didn't watch much TV. But in the early 1990s, things began to change, and they are still rapidly changing. Television programs and videos appeared that were specifically designed to appeal to babies and toddlers, Baby Einstein being a prime example, Teletubbies being another. At the present time, children under two years of age are reported to watch substantial amounts of television beginning as young, uh, I chose six months, you can kind of pick and choose from the literature, Dimitri said, four months, uh, but there's no question that they're starting to do it at much earlier ages. As interactive digital screen devices became common and popular, entertainment and educational software directed at young children began to appear. Perhaps most important, mobile touchscreen devices were developed and soon tens of thousands of apps were created for very young children. YouTube began to feature thousands of parent-created videos showing infants using touchscreen devices. Surveys are finding rapidly increasing use of touchscreen apps by infants, toddlers, and preschoolers. And in many cases, traditional paper books used by children and parents together are being replaced by e-books, which are often used by children themselves. With respect to early childhood, we have entered a new age of media. So in my career, in my lifetime, I've seen this enormous change, not just in the way children use television, but with all these other media entering the scene as well. Of course, television has not disappeared. Surveys indicate that young children still spend far more time watching video than they spend with interactive screen devices but this is probably changing as I speak. Since the advent of Sesame Street, a small number of intrepid researchers have tried to grasp what the impact of screen media use is on young children. The task has grown more difficult, but more important as the number of video programs and interactive apps proliferate, and as the time very young children spend with screen media increases. Today, we will try to summarize what we have collectively discovered, so we're not primarily talking about our own research, and to give some sense of the unanswered questions and challenges that we face. Our panel, Rachel Barr, Georgetown University, Heather Kerkorian, University of Wisconsin, and Sarah Lytle, University of Washington. Sarah replaced Patricia Kuhl, uh, who is in the same general research program, and they work together. I will pose questions to each of the panelists, and, uh, and the other panelists can jump in as they see fit. So we're going to start with Sarah, and we'll start out with Dimitri's initial topic. Let's deal with one issue right away. Since the 1970s, it has repeatedly been claimed that screen media influence young children's brain development. What do we, in fact, know about the neurophysiological, neuroanatomical, uh, or epigenetic effects of screen use by young children? Well, I think the short answer is that we really have not yet studied the effects of screen media on children's brain development. And I think you heard from Dimitri that we're starting to move that direction and we're starting to do some research that really you know, starts to point at what some of those effects may be, but we have not done that research on children yet. Um, that's the short answer. I think the long answer is that you know, we're, we're beginning to get the technology, and I think, you know, Dimitri rightly you know, cited some ethical concerns that you might have with these kinds of studies, but we're starting to get some of the technology that will allow us to ask these questions. Um, so uh, Pat Cool and I actually have some as yet unpublished data, but looking at how children and how their brains are activating as they're watching screen media, and it's revealing some patterns that, that we've seen before in some of our other published um, brain uh, studies, which is that you can sometimes see learning in the brain or learning as evidence through brain activation before you can see it in children's behavioral development, um, which makes a lot of sense and you know that, that follows the research on a number 
of levels. But um, one of the new techniques that we have at iLabs at the University of Washington um, is this magnetoencephalography machine, or MEG for short. Um, looks sort of like a hair dryer from Mars. You have a little mm -hmm. dome that the child or infant can, can put their head underneath, and it measures the changes in magnetic current. So as your neurons fire, they emit electric current. That changes the magnetic um, field around the head, and so we can measure that. The benefits to this machine are that it's completely noiseless um, and it allows some amount of movement for the child so they're completely awake and, and able to, to have some amount of small movement. Um, what that means for us, and I think for the screen media world, is that that really uh, gives us a, a great technology with which we can start to ask these questions. So using this you know, very silent machine uh, that children are able to you know, watch screen media, listen to screen media, really start to do that. Uh, um, we can start to do that research that really allows us to see exactly how the brain is operating as children are in these different situations, whether it's screen media versus you know, a social interaction or even different kinds of screen media. Um, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, we really are starting to be able to see some of this early activation pattern through the, the use of this machine. And um, I think one of the, you know, our recent findings here is we're able to see, you know, how children's language processing areas are activated well before they're ever actually using language. And so you can really start to see how the brain is developing and preparing and rehearsing that later activation. So I think we're developing the technology that will really allow us to ask this question in a much deeper way. Yeah, um, for those people who haven't done this type of research, most of the standard techniques for measuring brain activity uh, are, are rather difficult to use with the young children mm -hmm. uh, because they wiggle around a lot. If you're measuring brain electrical activity, the muscles generate electrical potentials, and that is uh, interfering and so on and so forth. So the MEG is just a, a mm -hmm. godsend and a, a future hope that, in fact, Dimitri's what are now speculations about affecting brain development uh, can be uh, actually elaborated and borne out. Um, and potentially uh, NEAR's technology could also, mm -hmm. NEAR infrared optical imaging, NEAR infrared optical imaging would also be a good technique that could be mm -hmm. um, developed further that is good for preschoolers. Um, and. Um, maybe a little bit more cost effective than MEG, which is, which is relatively expensive. So I think there's going to be a lot of different um, types of technology that will be able to address this question very soon. So we'll move to our next question, uh, and this is to Rachel. In two, 2005, Tiffany Pempeck and I published a review article claiming that infants and toddlers learn less from content delivered via a video screen than from equivalent live presentations. This phenomenon that we called the video deficit appeared to be limited to children under about three years of age. You published one of the seminal papers that actually established that phenomenon that we reviewed in our article. What have we learned about the video deficit in the decade since that article was published? So now we're primarily talking about learning uh, during uh, infancy and early toddlerhood uh, from screens. Right, I, I think we've actually come quite a long way in the past decade um, in my lab and many others around the country trying to sort of drill down into what does it actually mean to learn less from um, screen media than from face-to-face -face interactions. I want to underscore a couple of things about what it does mean. Um, when I say learn less, it does not mean that they cannot learn. In fact, uh, early studies from our lab showed that as young as six months, they can uh, learn information from um, screens, but they do learn it less. And I think what it does signal to us is that it is cognitively challenging. It's cognitively challenging to take information that you learn and apply it in the real world. And this sort of transfer of information from a screen to the real world is, is includes so many different um, factors. They have to perceive the information, they have to encode the information, they have to translate that perceptual information into a motor plan and then execute it out in the real world. That is a number of different steps. And they can actually do that beginning at six months, but they do, it's difficult for them and they are gonna learn less. Um, there's a lot of other factors um, that, uh, so how do they sort of take this, derive this semantic meaning? Uh, 
it's, it's difficult for them to do. So that's the big first takeaway. However, it's not impossible and we can support and scaffold that learning as well if we take advantage of what we know about child development and what we know about memory development. So I'm actually a memory researcher who found this whole idea of learning from screens a really interesting memory symbolic problem. How is it that babies could represent that information and then translate that information? And it turns out that we know a lot about early memory development that we can apply to our understanding of learning from media. So. Um, if we take what they know about semantic meaning, it turns out that babies will learn better if they know the semantic characters. So if they know the characters on the screen, this helps them transfer that information to the real world. If they see that information uh, a couple of times, more times, if you repeat it, they will transfer that information better. This is exactly the same experience that you've had if you're reading a book. If you read the book over and over, eventually the child, and they will request this because it's difficult, they will actually learn it um, more easily. And it turns out that it's not just video. It isn't just a video deficit. It's a transfer deficit. So we've actually replicated the same effects with books. It's harder to learn from books and to translate and apply that information to the real world unless you have repetition and characters and joint media engagement. It's also harder to transfer with touch screens. And I think that is a somewhat surprising finding. So when um, the nice thing about our studies with touch screens is that we can show them a game on a touch screen and we can show them the game in the real world and we can examine how they go in both directions. And it turns out if you show them on a touch screen and you test them on a touch screen, they do pretty well. And this is ranging in age from about 15 months to three and a half years of age. If you show them on the real world and you test them on the real world, they do well. However, if you ask them to go in either direction, from the 2D world to apply it in the 3D world, or the 3D world and to apply it in the 2D world, they have a transfer deficit. So it's a really, I think that is the, one of the most exciting findings that we've had, is to try and sort of figure out what it is that they can do, what it is that they are finding challenging, and then how we can support that. And I think we'll talk a lot more about that context of learning and the importance of joint media engagement um, later on. Um, <coughs> And that was my, and in and, uh, and that context, parents really have, a, and educators do have a really important role in that, so I would like to come back to that later. Anybody else have anything to add? I would very quickly add that, you know, there was a recent article that came out um, in the Psychological Science and Public Interest that looked at the science of learning, so to Rachel's point that we know a lot about how kids learn and you really can start to apply that to the screen media world. And so taking, you know, everything that we've learned about how children learn, and so instead of, you know, and this is you know looking specifically at apps that you know might call themselves educational, but we really have no bar thus far to to really determine whether apps are educational or not. But you know, t drilling down those those pillars of learning that we've learned over you know decades of research on on child development, and how can you start to identify things that are truly educational versus perhaps not? I can say, it, for me personally, I was very surprised in the first study we did where we found the what we called the video deficit at that time, and I thought it was a very puzzling phenomenon uh, because, you know, it seemed so transparent uh, to, to an adult anyway that this maps onto that. Uh, but in fact, I think the research in 10 years, we've actually come to know a great deal about this, what was initially a puzzling phenomenon. This is an area where we can actually can and do make real progress. Now, to Heather. Uh, we, including you and I, uh, have made the distinction between foreground and background screen media for young children. Foreground media are designed for young children and are more or less age appropriate and comprehensible to them. Background screen media are designed for older children or adults and are relatively difficult for young children to understand. Think of dad's football game going on in the background, uh, and a two-year-old. Um, background screen media are typically being used by parents or other older family members while infants and toddlers are present. What do we know about the differential cognitive impact of foreground versus background screen media? 
Um, so I'll tell you why I love this question. Uh, usually when anyone in this room talks about media use by young kids, we're talking about foreground media use. So we're talking about children watching television. We're talking about children using video games. Um, there's very, very little research actually on the impact of background television, even though, especially for very young children, infants and toddlers in the US in particular, um, it's, it's by far the majority of their time with screen media. So infants spend four to five times as much um, of their day in the presence of a television on in the background than they spend actually watching television. So the potential for impact, especially during those first few years of life that are so important, might actually be far greater for background media exposure, but we know virtually nothing about the impact of these types of media exposures. What we do know from experimental lab studies is that um, having a television on in the background can disrupt children's toy play, so they spend less time playing with toys. Um, and the quality of their play is decreased. They're less focused in their attention when playing with toys when the TV's on versus when the TV's off. We've also looked at parent-child interactions when the TV's on versus off. And we see, again, a decrease in the quantity and quality of parent-child interaction. So parents talk to their kids less, kids talk to their parents less when the TV's on. And the quality of the interactions that do exist decreases fairly substantially when the TV's on. Um, this has mostly been done in experimental lab settings, but there are a couple of cases. I mean, Dimitri talked about one case where it's actually been replicated in homes as well. So this isn't just an artifact of conducting this research in a laboratory setting. Um, but we don't know very much at all about the potential long-term effects. So we see immediate effects when the television is on. But you can imagine if children are spending hours per day with a television on in the background, and it's reducing the quantity and quality of their toy play and the quantity and quality of their interactions with people around them, there could be substantial long-term um, issues associated with lots of background television. And there are only a couple of studies that suggest that might actually be the case, but we really don't know very much at all about the long-term effects. Just to follow in, that the, the effects that have been associated with it actually are the ones that Dimitri was talking about in terms of poorer executive functioning being associated with higher levels of background television um, in from one to four years of age or concurrent studies sort of right across um, uh, the four to eight years of age as well. So it, so it may well be that it's that background sort of meaningless um, totally semantically difficult and impossible to comprehend information that is interfering dramatically with their ability to, to engage in, in what they need to do and play and learn. I should add, too, um, probably most of the research that's relevant is on sleep, actually. So children might be watching a television to fall asleep, but probably for most kids who have a TV on um, at bedtime, it's, we could consider it background television that they're not actually watching with the potential to learn. Unlike as Dan introduced, when children, um, at least by three years of age, probably younger, can learn educationally valuable information um, from foreground media exposure. And I, I would uh, just, uh, in terms of foreground media, uh, television for young children, other games, um, it, the Dimitri's work in part has established this uh, we really have to make a distinction in content. So when the content is really designed, age appropriate, and educational, we're, we don't tend to see these kinds of negative effects. So this is to Sarah. Uh, you and your colleagues, including Kath, Kathy hirsch Pasek, Patricia Kuhl, and Andrew Meltzoff have argued that social context is very important in children's learning from media and its longer-term impact. Georgine Troseth at Van Vanderbilt and others have also done important research on this issue. What do we know about the moderating effects of social context on learning from media and its impact? So the importance of social interactions really seems to come through quite strongly as we consider the context of children's media exposure and media use. And I've always been interested in, in how the, the social interaction piece plays a role in children's ability to learn from different kinds of screen media. And so I think you know, you've, you've, what we see is that um, you know, children tend to learn better if they have a social other who's present with them. And uh, some of the work that I've done looked at children's ability to learn new words, and we're looking particularly at action words, which are very hard for children to learn, uh, typically speaking. And it turned out that two and a half year olds, you know, were not able to learn these, this 
these harder words from a, ver a relatively difficult task when they were viewing traditional uh, video, so very passive viewing experience. But as soon as we plopped an experimenter next to them and had the experimenter sort of interact with them and kind of demonstrate, you know, and kind of uh, go over what they were learning from the screen, all of a sudden these two and a half year olds are able to learn. And so it's this co-viewing idea that you have the social interaction um, around the media and it really gets this idea of joint attention around a media source or, you know, people are calling it joint media engagement now. Um, also, so this idea that, that there's a social interaction going on around screen media. Um, you know, similarly, this, this um, work that I mentioned that Pat Cool and I have that um, uh, we have been working on, it has looked at the presence of peers. So if you take infants and put them in a screen media environment and have, you know, introduce a peer. So there's two nine-month-olds playing around a touch screen. All of a sudden, the two nine-month-olds seem to be learning much better than the one nine-month-old. Um, you know, there may be some, you know, preliminary competition going on there. We're not, you know, we're, we're interpreting it as some sort of, you know, in, in the arousal domain right now, some sort of social arousal. But, but this idea that there's the social other that's really facilitating learning in that context. The other way that I think is interesting and important to think about social interaction in the context of media is not just around media, but through media. So as we get new kinds of screen media, the more that media can facilitate social interactions, um, and thinking about video chats, for example, in particular, the more you really start to see those interactions through media. And so um, some work that, that Kathy Hirschpasek and I did uh, looked and compared children's uh, language learning, either in the, you know, this traditional social interaction <coughs> through video chat or through, uh, through passive video viewing. And I think, you know, as Dimitri was, was pointing out, you know, where we were curious as to where this video chat would fall. Would it look more like a live social interaction or would it look more like a traditional media source? And it turns out the kids, you know, two-year-olds were learning new language just as well from the video chats as they were from the live interactions. So this idea that it's, you know, perhaps not the screen per se, it's that you know, when you're afforded that social interaction through the screen, kids are all of a sudden, you know, very able to learn from it. Um, but again, underscoring this idea that, that the social interaction piece seems to be very critically important. Rachel. Um, it's, yeah, yeah the, the context of learning is really, is really, really crucial. So we've sort of now we've sort of talked a little bit about what Lisa Guernsey has called these mm -hmm. three C's: the child and the importance of considering their cognitive development, the absolute uh, importance of content is king, and now the third piece is this context of learning. And so learning around all different types of media and the role of not only parents but early educators in supporting and scaffolding that learning, I think, can't be emphasised enough. And so. When we've done studies with very young babies and they've learned from um, a difficult task going from a touch screen to the real world and back and forth, um, when parents are much, um, provide a lot of scaffolding around this, provide strong, uh, you know, uh, contextual language to help them make that connection, to connect the dots, those children with those supportive parents did a lot better. Um, in the early education settings, when uh, two touch screen, when um, there's been uh, budgetary considerations, and Alan Mortella's group has done this, where in some school districts you get one iPad per child, and in some school districts you get two iPads, um, it, it, an iPad to um, share. And it turns out that the children with the iPad to share who have to actively um, interact around that do a lot better than the children who are acting on their own. So this is sort of was a surprising economic um, finding. And then finally we've been doing some work on video chat as well. and. Um, with babies between um, six months and 24 months. And what we find is that um, in talking between parents and grandparents, so thinking about connecting people um, at a distance. So you can think of a lot of situations, um, parents who may be divorced, parents in the military, incarcerated parents, grandparents who are at a geographical distance. Video chat offers a really good opportunity for families to connect. And um, in this instance, again, the parents are really, really crucial in this role because Joint uh, visual attention looks very different across the screen. So the baby is on the screen and they're pointing to their grandparent, oh, look, look, to something that the grandparent cannot see. And what the, the parent then does is say, either switches the screen and then helps the grandparent own to say, what she's pointing to is her new toy over here. The children b bring a lot of um, toys to the grandparents to show them. They really jointly visual, visually attend around objects that they want to share with their grandparents despite the separation of the screen. And then what the parents are able to do is when the internet breaks down, the wireless breaks down, 
they can engage in tech talk and say, look, the, um, the Nana's wireless is playing up a little bit, let's just wait a second, connecting, connecting. And so they engage in this tech talk to sort of explain why these things are not necessarily going extremely smoothly. So that parent scaffold and having that parent right there really um, results in this very rich uh, communication back and forth. They're engaging in this joint vision of attention, they're engaging in this learning, parents are helping scaffold and problem solve. And it really is important um, from an affection and emotion point of view, they'll do this, you know, you blow a kiss um, to your grandparent. What they do across the screen is that they um, kiss on the screen, give a kiss to grandma across the screen. So it really is nice sort of a sharing of this um, affection as well. So I think video chat definitely has a lot of um, important uh, implications. Again, if we think about that context being really important um, and the goal of that interaction being really important as well. Can I add one more quick piece about video chat in general? So I think uh, video chat is an area where I think technology is going to improve and even more facilitate learning even further. So certainly as, as connectivity issues um, get better over time and people have access to, to higher quality internet. But the other piece of things too is that for as much as we know about the importance of eye gaze um, with a social partner being a critical piece for children's learning, eye gaze or video chat doesn't quite have that right right now um, in the sense that if you're looking at the screen, your eyes are going to sort of appear downcast and lots of technology firms are, are working on this. We've we, you know, talked to them a lot and you know, thinking about different ways to sort of you know, input that camera right in the middle of the screen so you really do appear to have much better eye contact with the child on the other side. So I think that's one area where I think technology as it improves will really help children's learning. And, and parents even for a really low tech solution what parents do is they will correct the behavior of the grandparents mm -hmm. so they say look up look up so that we can see you your head is cut off or move back further so 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 that is sort of we, we can have high tech and low tech solutions for mm -hmm. that as well okay we, we want to leave a little time for uh, the audience uh, this is to Heather and Rachel um, Toddlers have increasing access to touchscreen devices and age-directed apps, as well as, of course, video, as they have for a long time. Uh, you have each studied uh, toddler use of touchscreen interactive content, as well as video. What do we know about the differences between these media in terms of learning and longer-term impact? Is there any reason to encourage toddler use of one medium as compared to the other? So, for example, Dimitri was uh, speculating that uh, interactive touchscreen uh, would would have fewer of the fewer negative consequences than just using video. So, you guys are on the front line. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, so, the, so I'll do what Rachel did. Uh, was what Sarah did earlier. The short answer is we know actually very very little about the impact of newer technologies at any age, really, not just very young children. Um, but uh, the research that I've been doing that you talked about um, with my students, some of whom are here, uh, is uh, looking at what toddlers can learn from interactive versus non-interactive video and different types of interactions. Um, so we talked earlier about the video deficit or more aptly named transfer deficit, this idea that toddlers have difficulty transferring from the screen world to the real world. Um, using non-interactive video, and we've been using um, touchscreen tablets to make that video interactive to find out whether that actually increases what they can transfer, sort of like what Sarah's done with Skype and, and video chat. Um, and what we're finding are a couple of interesting things. So we're um, really focused around um, early two-year-olds, so 24 months of age, but we've been looking the full range from 24 to 36 months. But if we focus just on that youngest age, 24-month-olds tend to show this transfer deficit. They don't learn well from video. Um, when we give them interactivity that's really generic, so we just let them touch the screen however they'd like to play the game, that doesn't help them learn in any way at 24 months of age. But when we really scaffold that experience and tell them exactly where to touch, so for example, if I'm trying to teach them the word for a new object they've never seen before, and I have them touch the location of that object at the same time that I provide the name or around that same time, that improves learning substantially at 24 months of age. So this kind of really focused interactivity 
um, using an app we created for the study seems to really help them learn. And we found this with a couple of different studies now. What really surprised us is that um, this effect kind of reverses for slightly older children. So if you look closer to 30 to 36 months of age, they actually learn worse under those conditions. And they learn better either from passively viewing non-interactive video or from just touching anywhere on the screen and letting themselves guide the interaction. Um, and Sandy Calvert has found a similar finding in a, a different study with toddlers that around 30 months of age, just letting them advance the video um, uh, without really scaffolding that experience much for them seems to help them learn, whereas this very specific kind of interactivity actually disrupts their learning. So we only have a couple of studies and it's very preliminary, but the things that are really clear is that the exact nature of the video or the interactive experience that is most beneficial is going to vary substantially by age and even within a very narrow age range. So if we just look at two-year-olds, the types of experiences that are optimal can vary pretty substantially. And, and to add on to that, I think it really comes back to the vital importance of design features. And so we do know a lot about design um, from educational television programming because we've got 30 years of research on that. So well-designed programs we know result in good long-term outcomes. And I think we need to apply that same sort of rigor in terms of designing um, apps as well. And to, to follow up or to sort of underscore Sarah's point, this idea of taking what we know about the science of learning and applying that um, to apps as well is going to be really important. So I think that, that it's not going to be a question of whether they can learn better from one device or another. It's going to be a question about how it's designed and how the context around that learning is situated. That's going to be critical for educators because educators, we don't want to just say, look, take this device and it's going to be able to do this or take this device and it's going to be able to do that. You might want to show a clip of, say, um, an, a snake in some environment in um, Africa on a video clip and then embed that into your lesson plan and then afterwards see if they can do some sort of matching game on the app to make sure that they understand the principle of camouflage. So really trying to sort of figure out how to um, do professional development for educators, um, applying rigorous design principles to all types of media content is going to be really crucial and then that media engagement is going to be crucial. So again, in the, the task that I was telling you about this puzzle game, very simple puzzle game. We showed them on the screen, um, they did it, we showed them in the real world, they did it, transfer was difficult. And then we thought we'll just use a common app feature, we'll just do a ghost presentation so that the pieces would move by themselves and we'll see how the kids do because that's a very common app feature. Turns out that now we give them the touch screen back and they have no clue. Their performance plummets. So having someone show them how to do the puzzle, great. Having show, um, and doing this on either sort of device, great learning. However, that very basic um, app design feature really didn't work for them because it didn't sort of engage them socially, even though they had all of the same uh, information. So I think we need to take consideration of that social scaffold um, and that context of learning, as well as these other things about app design and what we and, and also what we know already. <laughs> a great deal of what we know already from designing good content. Great. Um, I'm actually, uh, I think, since I'd love to hear what questions the audience have, I'll forget our last one. The last question was simply what research needs to be done, uh, and maybe that'll come out uh, in, uh, in the question period. So I'd like to open it to the audience. I think we have about five minutes. Yes. Is there? Oh, there's a microphone on the stand there. Um, Erica? Um, and whether you think that's a possibility for the future or not. 
That's a great question, so I'll answer for myself and let others respond. Um, I've, been, uh, I've gotten emails from a number of app developers basically wanting me to give them my stamp of approval, which I'm not willing to do without research to back it up. Um, I did have one app developer ask if I would work with him to do research on his product to make it better and do kind of a formative research thing. Um, and I said yes, and then his web page turned into Heather Kerkorian, PhD, gave her stamp of approval and no research came out of it. So I think the um, uh, kind of the, the culture around having this kind of evidence-based app development isn't there the, yet the way it has been for television, um, but I, I hope that it will be. I will say that I, so I attended the South by Southwest EDU conference last year for the first time. Um, I would highly recommend it. I thought it was a fantastic environment. Um, but there turns out were a lot of app developers there and very interested in this topic. And it, I think we really had the conference sort of gave us a way to have a different kind of conversation about that because it really is what is the science, what is the research, um, and you know. Have, I have not necessarily had sustained relationships with these app developers, but they were asking the right questions and really wanting to do right by the research. So I think there are app out, uh, developers out there who are certainly doing that. Um, I think it's the sustained relationship part, at least for myself, that, that we that I've not had. I, I haven't with app developers either, and so, but I think it is, it's because it's so amorphous that so many people can create apps as soon as you've got that Apple code license, you're, you're good to go. But. Um, I think that, that collaborations between industry and research are going to be absolutely necessary in this uh, field moving forward. I'm trying to set a new norm that we stand up. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much. I have, I have one question, primarily I think for all of you. Um, <laughs> I, I thought it was interesting the distinction, of course, between foreground and background television. My question is, do we know anything about the ecology of homes today and the extent to which there is a lot of background television? Most of the early uh, work on it was when we had lots of constant television households. Now we are allegedly living in an environment of mobile um, technologies. So what do we know about the percentage of or the frequency of uh, background television being on all the time with these young children today? It's still, it's still high um, because people have mobile devices and they have televisions. So it's not that sort of the mobile devices sort of switched out and the televisions actually just got put to the way wayside. In fact, many of them ended up getting put in the bedroom, which is much more problematic. So if the child is sleeping in the bedroom with that television there, we know that that can have um, long-term negative effects. So it's still, it's still very high, but it'll be very interesting to track across time to see if that really does go down. Um, and, and it also depends on, um, I just, Vanderwater just came out with sort of a short st uh, study on Latino mothers in low income neighborhoods and looking at the importance in the family setting of um, having joint television experiences. And it's still, and that study literally just came out this month. So it's still a very important part of the, the um, ecological environment for that uh, group of families. And I think it probably is going to continue to be um, for a while, but we know that it's still pretty high. To Part of the reason I ask is I have uh, sons in their late 20s, early 30s. Neither of them have a television set in their house. So this is the and, new parents. And millennials are not buying television yeah, sets. Yeah, the new, they, they, but right, so, but your question was sort of right now, so I definitely think it's going to change. Yeah. But right now there's still an awful lot of televisions in people's houses. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for this. I'm Elizabeth Englander from uh, uh, Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts as well. And um, one of my interests is uh, in early childhood education. And I'm wondering where we're, we're seeing a dramatic reduction in traditional play in preschool and kindergarten, the introduction of formal education at a much younger <coughs> age instead of play. And as part of that formal education, uh, the increased use of quote unquote educational videos. Now I'm putting those in quotes because although the content is educational, there's a, a strong drive among these videos to compete with the kinds of videos that small children are watching at home. And so they do things uh, like, as Dimitri was talking about, with the very rapid transitions. I'm just curious if there's been any work. I realize you guys are, your, your subjects are a little too young for this. But I'm curious if there's been any work on sort of the displacement of play and the introduction of using these kinds of fast-paced videos as a way of formal education in preschool and kindergarten-age children. 
I don't know of any. I don't know of anything that fits exactly that. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> so it's uh, it looks like it looks like a, it's a fertile field. I think, I think the, the use of media in early education settings is still not, not well understood. There's relatively few, um, and this is despite the fact that children do spend a lot of time. So in centre-based care, it's still relatively low for the most part, particularly if centre-based care is quality care. So if um, quality childcare, the usage is low, but, um, but when there's poorer quality childcare, the usage is higher even in centre-based care. Well, changes like Common Core, there's a significant push towards formal education and the displacement of play in early childhood education. I mean, it might be interesting. I mean, it's problematic. If we go back to the science of learning principles, you know, joint active uh, engagement and so on, that doesn't really sort of fit with just having a video without it being supported by a lot of other things. So that, that might be another way to sort of think about how to meet common core standards, uh, but to do it in an age-appropriate way. I mean, it, I mean, I, I, I don't want to get into Common Core discussions, but, but, but just to think about, you know, just to, to st step back and think about science of learning, we know that play is absolutely essential for development. So how can we build, um, how can we build the educational setting to, to map onto that? How, how are we for time? Oh, okay, great. Good. Hi, I'm Angela Campbell for Georgetown Law. And I've been looking at the educational claims made by app developers, and a lot of them I think are misleading. Uh, and I've been thinking about is there a way to have some sort of criteria for what could be reasonably advertised as an educational app, but based on what you're saying about how there's so many variables in terms of the age, I guess whether you're 24 months or 36 months, and the social contest and so on, I'm wondering if it's would it even be possible, because it seems to me what would be educational for one child in one circumstance wouldn't necessarily be educational for another child in a different circumstance. So it, can we develop criteria that we could apply in the marketplace? Yeah, so I think, I, I think most of us have mentioned the, um, this new paper that's published in, I think, Psychology in the Public Interest, Psychological Science in the Public Interest. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that that's really going in the right direction. So we don't have a lot of research yet on how children learn best from interactive media, especially at younger ages, but we know a lot about how they learn in the real world. And to the extent that we can apply those principles to television or interactive media, I think will be really helpful. And to your point about what I said about 24-month-olds and 30-month-olds being very different, I have some thoughts about why that might be that are kind of, I think, beyond the level of what we're talking about here. I'm happy to talk offline about that. Um, but I think that that's kind of a different case where we were created an app for the purpose of our study that was very tightly controlled. It was nothing like the kinds of apps that kids would be downloading from the app store. Um, and so in that case, I think there are, there are some guiding principles that we can use as kind of best guesses at this point. Um, so there's really not much evidence, uh, there's just not much evidence-based um, principle, I think, yet uh, directly addressing interactive media, but there's a lot of evidence-based guesses, I think. I would add to that that I think, you know, one of the reasons I think looking to the science of learning is helpful it, because, I mean, anybody can create an app, apps pop up, you know, all the time at such a rapid pace that, you know, even if there were an organization that were willing to put that, you know, good housekeeping stamp of approval on an app that says it's educational, it would be an immense task given the rate of development and mm -hmm. given the time and energy that would go into rating such a thing. And so I think it's smart to consider it from sort of the other end of the spectrum, which is, you know, what are the principles? And so the more that we can educate, you know, parents, caregivers, uh, provi you know, child care providers, teachers about sort of these principles and what to look for and really equip people to be their own judges of this kind of content, um, I think that you know potentially is the more economical and, and easier way to go here. So. And and I just I keep sort of referring back with um, television. There's been a lot of um, content analysis on television programs. So Deb mm -hmm. Linebagger and I did a whole series of um, studies on infant-directed media content, and we looked carefully at educational claims because the exact same issue that is coming up with apps. Um, on educational claims came up with infant-directed media um, when, when there was sort of that explosion about uh, 10 years ago, and, uh, or 15 years ago, really, in infant-directed media. And there were similar uh, 
quite large claims, like this is going to improve your brain development and so on, that weren't really substantiated. So we had a look through and we also then mapped it on to specific content areas to see, you know, what was it that um, was, you know, what was the content that was included using um, actually educational standards to sort of refer back to what it is that would typically be designed at different ages. So I think, I think that more work does need to be done along those lines as well um, for apps. But I totally agree with Heather and uh, Sarah that it really is going to have to be um, thinking about larger guiding principles as well. This side of the room apparently has more questions. <laughs> questions. <laughs> Curious people. Um, my name is Lauren Hale. I'm at Stony Brook where I teach public health and I'm also the editor of the journal Sleep Health, so you might guess where I'm going. Uh, I'm also a mom and I love the idea of two young boys, so I'm very pleased and you know, optimistic that there might be some educational benefit of uh, these interactive devices for learning. But I think my question is just to step back and say, let's, learning is not the only outcome of interest. We want health, we want good behaviors, we want happiness, we want sleep, of course we want sleep. And especially when we're looking at the differences between passive and interactive media, uh, so far, the evidence suggests the interactive media is at a higher risk of interfering with sleep. So uh, I would encourage you in your uh, work, and I want to hear what you think about this, to at least consider timing of when these interactive apps are permitted in households. Because doing uh, interactive stimulating, even a FaceTime or Skype conversation right before bedtime with grandma is probably not conducive to a good night's sleep, which children need for learning, memory, <laughs> health, functioning. So. I have a colleague at UMass who's a leading researcher on sleep, and uh, I, I got her to start thinking about Rebecca media. Rebecca Spencer? And she is now saying mm -hmm. that in, in uh, studies that she hasn't yet published, but it's looking as if media use, particularly for uh, preschoolers, uh, media use is coming out as a really important variable and uh, quality of sleep and other issues. For sure, but I, what I really want to point out is this different. Passive media is probably not as bad, it's not good for young children, but interactive media at bedtime, it's high risk, and if it's something that a kid starts doing, it's gonna interfere with. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. And, and, and I think it does come back to this sort of principle again that you know, what is the really goal of preschool development is sort of emotion regulation and um, you know, learning, calming strategies and so on. And so if we do provide really stimulating uh, events before sleep, that's going to be problematic. And now we've collected some um, time use uh, information where we haven't really delved in entirely to sleep that, that you know, we need to look at more, much more carefully now that we know much more about um, the crucial role of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also add that when we, in terms of sort of social effects, that's where I kind of alluded to the background television um, having a, apparently very disruptive effects on social interactions. Um, for the most part, the longitudinal research that look at long-term effects of background television um, exposure focus on the cognitive outcomes. But um, I, I suspect if we also had a study that looked at social outcomes, we'd that would be really important to look at as well. Um, and also in terms of learning, we, we all study cognitive development, so the language we use tends to be around academic and cognitive knowledge. Um, but I think everything that we've said can apply to social, emotional, educational lessons as well. And I, I, would, I would suggest that you know, we'd, and we do a lot of work with parents and providers and caregivers, and, and we oftentimes encourage them to think about you know, what the learning goal is. And so if the learning goal is, you know, a very particular skill that you're trying to build, then you know a particular kind of interactive media might be the way to go. Um, whereas if the goal is you know entertainment for 10 minutes, then you know that you know might lead to a different media choice um, by you know on the part of parents or caregivers. But I think your point is well taken that perhaps you know another element to the learning goal is sort of within the context of the day and thinking about the timing and and really how that media fits into the routine of the day. And I think, you know, Michael Rich's sort of idea of mm -hmm. planning out the day and thinking about, well, what are all of the things, and this sort of goes back to play, to sleep, to, you know, what are all of the things that children need to actually have in their day, and then um, where would media fit in, rather than sort of starting with, you're going to have two hours of media or not. And then the other thing is the importance of thinking about um, recommendations for parents. This is a really 
clear recommendation for parents around the importance of having a calming bedtime routine. And we know that from many, many studies. Like we know that, and so that would be a really, I think could be very, very useful and powerful for parents to think about when not, if they're doing that media day planning, then be bedtime routine is not where to add that in. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Leno Stryker, and I'm from the Society <coughs> for the Study of ASD and social communication. And I must say I have a very different perspective from what I've heard so far. Uh, the conversation seems to be how can we use this media to integrate with uh, the lives of our children to make our lives, their lives better. But what if media doesn't belong in the lives of our children? What if it is causing, we talk about ASD, autism, we, uh, Dr. I talked about uh, ADHD, all these things, the disruption of social behavior. I think media uh, disrupts social behavior. And, we're, and you're bringing in how, how can we use media to uh, foster joint attention? Well, the simplest way to use media to foster joint attention is to turn the, the screen down, <laughs> face the child, and talk to them and interact about what's important to you and the people around you in your family, in your culture, the way you live. Uh, so uh, I just want to say one more thing, is that in medicine, which is my background, we try to understand do no harm first before we try to, before we try to do anything else. And I think that answer that question needs to be raised about the role of media in children's life. What kind of harm is it doing now? And what do we know about the harm that it's doing now? And shouldn't that be our first focus of study before we start look for these benefits for problems that don't even exist? Thank you. I, I think. <laughs> I think. There, is, there are two issues. Uh, I, I'm in, in agreement with a lot of the things that you said, but uh, there are really two issues. Uh, and the history of television is very instructive. Uh, the first, first issue is it's not going to go away just because you say it should. Uh, children are not going to stop using the media just because you don't think they should. Parents are not going to stop using media just because you say they should. All these things were said about television in the 1950s and 1960s. It took until 1960, the late 1960s with Mr. Rogers, with Sesame Street, and the research showing positive impact of those to uh, begin to realize that the media can actually be used to children's benefit, uh, and because all the focus for all the early years was on the negative uh, impact of television on children. And that ne negative impact is real, I'm, don't get me wrong, and the, the potential negative impact on sleep and many other things of the interactive media is probably real as well. But the fact that just like the history of television, uh, I think we have to learn how to use it as a tool for the betterment of humanity, not just wish it away. as of baby Einstein, and the studies are not being done on the, on the dangers. And, you know, quite frankly, I see a lot of body cancer around. I see a tremendous increase in the number of kids with autism. I see a tremendous kid increase in the number of children with ADHD. And, and it's affecting, it, it's affecting uh, families throughout the world. And so why is the studies being done? Why, why aren't we here talking about the studies being done about the dangers of this stuff? I think you'll actually ways they can help us. I think in this 
in this three days, you're going to hear a lot of studies about the uh, negative impact of, of media. Um, it's, it's just unusual that uh, we had a, a panel that started uh, taking a somewhat more positive approach. But if you, <laughs> but if you were, but really, if you're paying attention, background television, for example, is, I think, a serious issue. And background mobile media, which haven't yet, yet been studied, when I say background mobile media, I mean mobile media as they're being used by parents and taking parent attention away from the children. Um, it's just, I, I, I think when you really get into studying this stuff, you don't see it as an either or question. And, and just to sort of follow in on that, that was one point that we had hoped that we would bring up and sort of even for a future direction is, is how we use media ourselves, so how parents use media, sort of the context. And if you think, um, you know, if you go to a playground, uh, this is a good example. Oftentimes you will see um, parents are sort of looking at their screens and the children are playing. Now, in the past, parents would have been talking to other people. It's not that they would have had 100% of their attention on their child, but it is a change in behavior. And so I think we do need to sort of think about that. And um, whether or not if a parent is engaging with a child and they're suddenly looking at their screen and they're like this, if anybody has seen the still face paradigm, it's pretty much the still face pa paradigm for the baby. So I think that we really need to uh, you know, we need to think about the context of parental media use as well. But I really think we do have to be balanced in our approach and think about, well, what are potential benefits, what are potential harms, what is in between. Um, and, you know, we need to look at the whole picture because um, going back, you know, what was the purpose of um, Sesame Street being created was to try and reduce the achievement gap and to provide resources to families that didn't actually have them. So we need to sort of think about... Um, but think about that technology also as a potential resource for families, particularly for under-resourced families. And I just want to sort of underscore the importance of that as well. Well, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I got the, uh, uh, the sign of the hook. So uh, <laughs> th thank you very much. We'll take a 15 minute break and be back at 10.30 to hear about the future of virtual reality. <laughs> <laughs>